by Katie Dobbs feature Reiterman, May 21, 2018 In 1907, Flora MacDonald Denison wrote Ontario's premier letter, inviting him to dinner, the newspapers report U.S. saying that women would get the vote if they want it, she wrote. We are anxious to have this hour of your company and a word from you, a portrait of Flora MacDonald Denison, who thought women could be much more than bearers of children. The protest and will continue to protest with all the strength of the womanhood in me against the treatment of our sex in every walk of life, courtesy Cloyne and District Historical Society, they would make for interesting dinner dates, Denison was a prominent Toronto suffragist. Sir James Whitney, Conservative Premier of Ontario from 1905 until his death in 1914, was a staunch but polite opponent. His correspondence at the Ontario Archives reflected the world that he lived in and Denison railed against, I am sure every reasonable man will understand, such and such, and, not all temperance men, believe this and that. 1-8 Sydney Frey, from Nova Scotia asked a question about women's suffrage Whitney's secretary responded, Dear Sir, when Denison and the other suffragists began their frequent agitations for the vote, Whitney would tell them they certainly made good points, but who was he to dispute God's plan for women? He liked to reference an old speech by the late agriculture minister who said that it was the selfish minority of women who wanted the vote but they certainly shouldn't get it because home life and morality were already under attack and political warfare would degrade Ontario women. So, Whitney wrote back to Denison to clarify, women didn't really want the vote. So far as the words go, I was correctly reported, but in order that there be no misunderstanding, I think I should say that I completed the sentence you quoted with the words, but I am quite satisfied they do not want it, he wrote. I hope the occasion will be a success, Whitney wouldn't dine with Denison, but that wouldn't break her will. A century ago, most Canadian women got the federal vote but because she died in 1921, Denison is usually overshadowed by the famous five who fought and won the 1929 person's case, and forgotten, more generally, because people are, less interested, in the suffrage movement, notes Deborah Gorham, a distinguished research professor in Carleton's history department, that's too bad, because the suffrage was important. Getting out and voting is one of the few things we can do where we can actually make a mark, she says. She should be remembered. Denison had been fighting for years for the right to vote, and at the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library at the University of Toronto, her salvos to people like Whitney live by the box load. In handwritten speeches, her anger roils at the double standards, I wasn't it insulting that the highest office that a woman was expected to attain was marriage, with a vow to obey, a husband? Don't get her started on the outdated property laws or the way that Christianity held to the idea that women were inherently wicked. How could nobody see that the entire system was unfair? Centuries upon centuries of wrong have so habituated the minds of men and women to think that the position in which they are placed is the only one that could be, she writes in one speech. Women were so much more than childbearers. They were artists, musicians, doctors, botanists, I do protest and will continue to protest with all the strength of the womanhood in me against the treatment of our sex in every walk of life. Flora MacDonald Denison was the president of the Canadian Suffrage Association from 1911 to 1914, born in 1867, in Hastings County, ONT. Denison was the sixth of eight children. Her father, George Merrill, was a schoolmaster who distrusted organized religion, her mother was a teacher. George moved his family deep into the marble rocky hills of eastern Ontario only to lose their savings on a failed mining venture. He would probably be called a devoted husband. Denison wrote in a book about her childhood, except he spent most of his leisure time trying to solve algebra problems and failing to invent a perpetual motion machine. As a young woman Denison worked briefly as a teacher, but she was a dressmaker by trade, a line of work that would set her apart from many in the suffragist movement. She always believed in financial independence. No tragedy can be more terrible than a woman marrying for support, she would later write in a newspaper column.
she picked up the Denison mantle when she moved to Detroit as a young woman and entered into a form of marriage with Howard Denison in 1892, as her entry explains in the Dictionary of Canadian Biography. It's a little fuzzy, he was already married, but perhaps the marriage was formalized after his first wife died. They had a son named Merrill together in 1893, he would be the man she was closest to in her life, his role in her life is not clear, the relationship would end in 1914, the DCB notes of Howard. It was a different kind of family, given the era. But Denison was unconventional, to me she had an honesty about her and a willingness to think beyond social norms that was quite unusual for the time, says Joan Sangster, author of 100 Years of Struggle, The History of Women and the Vote in Canada. Augusta Stogallen, left, with her mother Emily Stowe. Augusta, pictured in 1883, became the first woman to graduate from a Canadian medical school. Emily, who studied medicine in the U.S. After Canadian universities refused her entry, was the first Canadian woman to precise medicine in Canada, Women's College Hospital Archive, when the Denisons moved to Toronto around the time of Merrill's birth, Toronto's most prominent suffragists were a mother-daughter doctor duo, Emily Stowe and Augusta Stogolin. Emily Stowe created Toronto's first suffragist organization in 1876, disguising it as a literary club. Stowe was inspired to become a doctor after her husband's illness in the 1860s, but no universities in Canada would accept her, so she studied medicine in the U.S. A literary club disbanded in the early 1880s, as Stowe and her daughter, Augusta Stowe Gullen, formed a series of suffragist organizations, helping to push open the doors of University of Toronto. Stowe Golan was the first woman to earn a medical degree in Canada, they fought for the municipal vote, which single female property owners were granted in 1884, they deployed petitions, pamphlets and humor. In 1896, Stowe and the suffragists held a mock parliament at Allen Gardens to debate whether men should get the vote, as Sangster notes in her book. They were the toast of the town with their zingers, should men be allowed to wear dangerous stockings while cycling? Should they be forced to retire from their teaching careers once they marry? Should a curfew bell tinkle at 10 p.m.? To get the men off the streets, unless accompanied by their wives? Denison was in awe of Stowe, she called her, Canada's greatest woman, she met Stowe shortly before Stowe's death in 1903, another fuzzy detail, and was soon ensconced in the cause. By 1906, Denison was the secretary of the Suffrage Association and traveled to Copenhagen as the Canadian delegate at the International Women's Suffrage Alliance. By 1911, she was president of the local suffrage organization, now named the Canadian Suffragist Association. She traveled to Washington in 1913, bringing her teenage son Merrill along for a suffrage march. Her home at 22 Carlton Street occasionally doubled as the head office. Denison was a journalist along with being a dressmaker. She once managed the custom dress department at the Simpsons department store, and wrote about how the clothing industry exploited women in articles for Saturday night, CBD notes. She would later support a strike of female employees in the clothing industry, and Gorham classified Denison as a socialist when she wrote about her. By 1905, she had her own firm, Denison Costumer, but most fashion edicts enraged her, the corsets, and the skirts with a circumference so small that women had to hobble around the streets, the pointed heels that were useless on the rich Toronto street car floors. Even the portrait of the late Queen Victoria that hung in Ottawa showed a tiny laced in waist measuring less than 18 inches, a pair of very wide hoops over which hung a voluminous dragging skirt, she wrote in an unpublished manuscript at Thomas Fisher. By the first decade of the new century, Denison was one of the most prominent names writing about suffrage in Canada. In addition to Saturday Night, she had a weekly column in Toronto Sunday World, where she wrote about women's issues.
In her papers at Thomas Fisher, she has dozens of letters from supporters and adversaries, friends who call her Flo. Many people were lobbying against her cause, usually arguing that women's suffrage would lead to socialism, race suicide, and nothing less than the complete decline of the British Empire. Others thought the idea was a big joke. There's a letter from Prime Minister Robert Borden agreeing to a brief meeting, and a piece of anonymous hate mail telling her to stick to her own class, don't get a swelled head, that ugly letter essentially says, go home dressmaker, Gorham says. It does tell you something about the women's movement and social class in Canada at the time, so she's not totally acceptable. There are suggested edits to one of her speeches that speak to Denison's charisma. A friend thought Dennis not to nix the part about it being high time men wash dishes. But it is you who will read it and with your fascinating magnetic presence, you can say what in print would only arouse antagonism. As Denison and her friends tried to win over the government through petitions and speeches, other tactics were capturing the world's attention overseas. In the United Kingdom, Emmeline Pankhurst and the Women's Social and Political Union were tired of broken promises, so they turned to militant tactics, hurling rocks through windows, lighting mailboxes on fire, hunger strikes and other unladylike and unlawful habits, the press noted. They were called the suffragettes, initially a derisive term, distinct from suffragists, they were adept at timing their protests to make sure a newsreel camera was nearby. Film technology was advancing, and Hollywood took notice of the cause, releasing films in which women like Tennyson were depicted as hectoring, brash ladies who abandoned their families and emasculated their husbands. Sangster notes in her book that American suffragists helped make their own films but they could not overcome the immense power of the Hollywood machine, churning out endless anti-feminist fare. In 1913, the newsreel cameras were rolling at the Epsom Derby, a famous annual horse race in England. Emily Wilding Davison, with two suffragette flags pinned to her jacket, walked in front of the horses thundering around the loop. The newsreels caught the haunting moment of impact, and the sensational crash spread around the world with Davison's motivation debated ever since. As she was dying in hospital, people sent hate mail. One letter preserved in the London School of Economics Library calls her an idiot, unworthy of existence, and hope that she lives in torture, Denison traveled to England after Davison's shocking death and went to many electrifying meetings, where some of the women's social and political union leaders were dragged away by police. She admired Pankhurst's volcanic force and the way she swayed people into feats of sacrifice, but by the end of her visit she wrote in her weekly column that she'd had enough of the militant meetings. She had to be careful, says Tara Brookfield, who writes about Denison and other Ontario suffragists in her upcoming book Our Voices Must Be Heard, Women and the Vote in Ontario. Denison knew that Canada wasn't ready for militancy, but she didn't condemn it either. The spirit, the endurance, the pertinacity of these women is without a parallel in our history, she wrote admiringly in her column. The suffragettes gave the cause more visibility, says Sangster, but Canadian suffragists were constantly being asked if they take the same methods. And that's where Denison got into some trouble, mentioning a hypothetical assassination of British Prime Minister Herbert Asquith, who was against women's suffrage. Personally I am not in favor either of war or capital punishment but so long as militancy is one of the keynotes of British policy I should not condemn Mrs. Pankhurst any more for shooting Premier Asquith and I condemn the British soldiers for mowing down the Boers in South Africa, Denison is quoted as saying in an undated clipping in her files, our silly misses. Denison, the Ottawa Evening Journal shot back, I was, out Pankhursting, the suffragettes, I don't think she was ever afraid of anything, Gorham says, noting that, she didn't do anything of a radical nature that would have landed her in jail, but she was losing. Allies, events in England in the past six months have caused me to stagger back into the same selfish wicked life I once had on this subject, the reverend of a Protestant church wrote her in 1913, cancelling a meeting.
give me a little time and perhaps I may get into the state of grace again, Flora McDonald Benison's business card. During a time of great social change, the majority of Canadian suffragists were white, middle or upper middle class. The movement was not inclusive of agitating for the voting rights of racialized women, writes Natasha Henry, president of the Ontario Black History Society, in the latest issue of Heritage Matters. Xenophobia and fear of the other often crept into suffrage rhetoric. In her book, Sangster writes that suffragists saw themselves as enlightened nation builders, and that many saw immigrants as targets of assimilation, rather than sisters in struggle. Ideals of shared international sisterhood were always asserted, but they remained ambiguous and precarious, easily overwhelmed by the more powerful belief in white, Euro-Canadian superiority, she writes. Augustus Dalgolan, in another of Denison's old clippings, writes, Canadian women are surely the mental equal of the Duke of Boers, the Poles, and the Galicians of the West. In another speech from 1905, Dogoland derided the injustice of being classed with aliens, lunatics and the feeble-minded, Denison was considered progressive and unconventional, a supporter of free love and easier divorce, frustrated by class divides. But she, too, had dismissive references. In one newspaper article she called the immigrant heavy ward neighborhood in Toronto a poverty-stricken foreign slum, whose inhabitants needed education. It wasn't her biggest push to speak like that, but it definitely came up in her writing, says Brookfield. I don't know if that was strategic, or that was how she thought, or both. Andrew Baldwin, a geography professor at Durham University in England, doesn't think Denison's whiteness would have been apparent to her. That doesn't make it okay, but it's just how people thought of race at the time, says Baldwin, who has written about Denison. People talked about it unapologetically. In the years before the First World War, tension percolated in Toronto's suffragist movement. Denison and their other leaders of the Canadian Suffragist Association were mostly working women, but a group of middle and upper class newcomers had created their own organization, called the Equal Franchise League. They worked with Denison's Canadian Suffragist Association initially but in 1914 they severed ties. A small clipping in Denison's file politely credits the split to an effervescence of feeling, but more specifically, some women in the league didn't think the CSA was very democratic, others thought they were a little too partisan, and there were personality clashes. An orthodox Denison was the old guard, and some of the league women saw her as a liability with her beliefs, her support for the militants, her career as a dressmaker. I really think the newcomers wanted more leadership opportunities, and the CSA had long established suffragists who were not going to step aside to allow women who just discovered suffrage to take over and think they could do better. Brookfield says. Calligraphy presented to Denison when she retired as president of the Canadian Suffrage Association, in 1914, she resigned in late 1914 and worked as a seamstress in Napanee, ONT, to make ends meet. She spent time in New York working for a suffrage campaign. We have received glowing reports about you and your fine work from everyone, a secretary with the New York State Woman Suffrage Party wrote in 1917, and traveled between Toronto and eastern Ontario. Denison had always loved the Canadian shield of her youth. She bought the Bonico in on Mizanah Lake in 1910, although how she financed it is unclear. Gorham says Denison didn't have a lot of money, but as a successful dressmaker, she had been a self-supporting woman for years, also supporting her husband, at times. She knew that earning your living was not something you were supposed to do if you were a mother, Gorham says. It was at Bonico that her spiritualism, her passion for nature and her love of Walt Whitman converged. Whitman's humanist ideals had long influenced Denison's beliefs. She saw Whitman as a self-expressive, democratic poet who wanted to destroy systems based on the inequality of men and women, the Walt Whitman Archive notes.
Denison made Bonico the wilderness retreat of the Whitmanite movement and arranged to have a Whitman quotation cut into the stone of the Bonico cliff, above indigenous pictographs, my foothold is tenant and mortisty in granite, I laugh at what you call dissolution, and I know the amplitude. Of time, she hosted teas in his honor, wearing a dress the color of the forest, deep brown satin embroidered with green and gold, and she published a magazine called The Sunset of Bon Echo, where she wrote about Whitman, the suffrage movement and her growing spiritualism. She was still an honorary president of the Canada Suffrage Association on the official letterhead, and dinner at the Bon Echo Inn was served on, boats for women, plates. In 1919, Flora McDonald Denison had Mazana Rock in Bonico inscribed with a Whitman quotation to celebrate the centenary since the author's birth. She is underneath the P in amplitude. During the First World War, many suffragists believed they should put the cause on hold, but Denison wasn't one of them. She was opposed to the war, but her son enlisted anyway. In 1916, the western provinces began to fall like dominoes as Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta gave women the vote. The Toronto suffragists united at Queen's Park in March 1916 to make the case that Ontario shouldn't be left behind. Since the last deputation here, many of us have sent our sons to the front, and you men have been on every platform telling us how grand and just we are. Denison said, Give the women of Ontario what they ask for. In the spring of 1917, Ontario gave women the vote. Not long after, Denison's longtime pen pal, Prime Minister Borden, made a calculated move, temporarily granting women who served in the military and women who had relatives in the military the vote, in order to approve his controversial conscription measures. It was implied that if they voted correctly, and they did, conscription passed, they would be enfranchised after the war, Brookfield explains. The right to vote in federal elections was granted to Canadian women on May 24, 1918, regardless of whether the provinces had already given them the vote. But not everybody was included in this historic victory. Asian Canadians would have to wait until the late 1940s for full inclusion. For Indigenous Canadians who didn't want to give up treaty rights, it was 1960, and even then, ballot boxes were not brought to Inuit communities in the Arctic until 1962, the Canadian Encyclopedia notes. It appears the Star and the Globe didn't call Denison for a comment on the long-sought federal suffrage. She had faded out of the cause. Her magazine had fewer suffrage stories these days, more Whitman news. 1921, she had several health setbacks. In January, her son wrote her, Dear little Mim, I was very sorry to hear that, Mr. Eaton's store had fed you some ripe fish and hope that you get as fit as a fiddle back at the hospital. It seems a good idea to me to park there for a while and rest up. She has been weakened by Spanish influenza in 1919 and developed pneumonia during a visit to Bonico in the spring of 1921. In May, she was convalescing at the home of a family friend in Toronto, and a visitor reported she was bright and more normal than any day yet, but she was dead a week later, only 54 years old. Heart trouble, said the Globe of the suffrage pioneer who spoke out when few women had the courage or confidence. In the 1950s, her son donated the family land to the provincial government, which transformed Bonico into a provincial park by the 1960s. She loved that land best. In the last issue of Bonico magazine, she described a cold December night when she was alone with her dog and cat at the inn, reading Whitman's poetry into the night, as temperatures plunged. She left the cozy and every so often to watch the lake snap and crackle as it froze under the full moon. It was an incremental struggle, like many she had waged, I.
stood at its edge and watched it for a long time, creeping, creeping, inch by inch till at 1.30 it had reached this western shore, top stories, delivered to your inbox, new N-E-W-S-L-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-A-D-L-I-N-E-S-S-I-G-N-Up.